really fast, I realized I was like, man, this is combining like all the things that to this point, very physical, all the stuff I was doing, I was like with my body, you know, requires focus, like, you know, like meditating, mm -hmm. like every action is like really thought out. And just like all these things fell into place, you know? And so I'd never been in the wood, the craft shop, nothing. But really fast, I realized, I think this is like what I should pursue. Hello, and welcome to Architecture, Design, and Photography. I am currently sitting in the seat of the person who we will soon be talking to, whose name is Stefan. Stefan Rurek, to be exact. He's an atelier who merges modern conceptual design with time-honored craftsmanship. His bespoke furniture is made using a variety of materials and built to span generations. Rick recently moved from Brooklyn, New York, to Maine. I found this to be true of a lot of people here in Biddeford for some reason. Uh, he moved here with his wife and their daughter, Wanda. Our interview today is sponsored by Maine Home Design. Don't miss Rurek's design theory in the upcoming issue of Maine Home Design. Thank you for coming to the studio today. Stefan Rurek, where are you from? <laughs> uh, yeah, you saw the 202 number. Like, so like, that's my like personal cell. Okay. I have like one of those, like, cause I've been in New York for like 15 years. So I have like a, a New York. Pull number. that mic up there to you a little bit there. Yeah. I have a New York number. So like, I seem more legit with the business. You yeah. Know? Like I'm a New York business. Cause that's yeah, we have, we have a studio in New York. Well, that's, where, my well, that's where, that's where after college I went straight yep. to New York and that's where years later I started the business but to your point the 202 number obviously to people it seems like someone like why why is someone calling you from fucking did you call earlier than just like two minutes yeah ago yeah as well? like I thought I was gonna be early because I oh, called okay. you I'm like neurotic I was like hey I'm gonna be here at like 9 50 or something is that cool and like I left oh, a voicemail right. yeah we're but, not um, we're not too scheduled here yeah yeah no like that's the way I work but um uh so I have like a 347 number that's on the same phone. It's like How many those, cell phones? Do you, oh, you have two numbers Google on phones. the same phone. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So it was just like it was just like what I use for business. But okay. Um, so can you just, tell when people call like this is a business call because no, it's going to that number or no? It always oh. it always just comes in on the same number. That's what's uh. kind of messed up about it. But like to clients, I would like call out from the New York number. Oh, so you choose and you're yeah, like, I can I'm choose calling from New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like. I've really, to be honest, in the past few years, I could care less. It's just like two or two. Well, no, I mean, it, it's <laughs> it's absolute clout because, I mean, New York is a very hard place to make it. So if you can call from a place that's hard to make it, you know, you're coming with some, like that little bit of clout ahead of time that's like, yeah. and well, for some reason, I gravitated towards, you know, initially going to a place that had no clout and everyone's like, why, why are you there? I was like, I don't know. It's yeah. really nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, but, you know. But now you're like, you've been here and now you have people like me coming here. Yeah. So yeah. So it's I, like, you can like look at people like me and be like, see, see, <laughs> you know, I can go na, 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 na. Yeah. Yeah. See, like now you're coming here and I was here like 10 I've been here the whole, plus years I, ago. I was here when things were cheap. Yeah, exactly. You know, the weird thing is though, when I was in architecture school and knew I was going to be moving here because my friend Caleb came here probably three years ahead of me because he went right from high school into architecture school, did everything as you, sh as you should. Yeah. And, you know, uh, and I would, uh, I completely forgot what I was saying. That's hilarious, but <laughs> it happens. It, uh, <laughs> I would, um, yeah, I'd, I'd look at the situation here and compare it to other places. And I just kind of, I mean, I knew that I could surf. I knew it was somewhere I wanted to be. And I, I knew it was a place where I'd want to have a family. Yeah. I, I knew I didn't want to go somewhere that was going to be crowded. And I knew I didn't want to be stuck in a city. Yeah. But I knew there was potential here, like Bitterford specifically. Oh, that's what I was saying. Bitterford specifically had a lot of potential. I even looked at like when we came here, we considered Portland. And I was like, Portland's done. Like, mm. People have moved to Portland at cheap property values yep. and spent a couple decades making it a really cool place. Yeah. If I go there, I'm going to pay for someone else's vision and creativity. Mm -hmm. If I go to Biddeford, it's not that yet. Biddeford yeah. in 2003 
the percentage of males in the summer downtown without shirts was very, very high. Okay. If I can just say that. Yeah, yeah. Now, it, there's a little bit of like, maybe I should put a shirt on. Uh-huh, and, uh-huh. You know. Yeah, yeah. And it's very interesting. But when I was in um, architecture school, it was just <laughs> so sad to say. It was just when the internet was coming out. And like you'd look online at like all the houses for sale because we knew we'd be moving there and we'd be looking to buy a house and you could back then get a house for like $90,000 or no, like 30 or 40,000 some houses like downtown, wow. right? And so I'd look at these on realtor.com and when we got here, it was weird because you'd drive around town and you'd look around and I felt like I was seeing famous people because it was like I'd see the realtor's photos and then I got here and I was like, oh, there's that white duplex that I could maybe get, you know? And yeah. And so it, it was interesting to just move here and realize like this, this is a place that's not done yet. And it's funny because my parents were always very uh, cul-de-sac people, if mm. you will. They like a subdivision that has bylaws and all that and everything's done and neat. And, and here I am moving to downtown Biddeford with all of its eccentricities. But for some reason, the harsh climate, the harsh town, the harsh environment like was appealing. It, it feel felt it felt creative to me so i don't know there's something about i mean you're here why are you here you know is, is it yeah. the same kind of idea in some way or uh i think yeah i mean it's uh, obviously it's a uh, an amalgamation of things but um i am here because i like maine why so- do you like maine well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm one of those assholes who's coming up here for a couple of weeks in the summer, you know, uh, so I don't know, like we were just up in Rangeley for a couple of days and I felt like that. Yeah. Okay. You know, there's all these people that live there and you're just like, I'm going to be here and enjoy it. Well, it's pretty. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm the first to say that, but anyway, uh, we, you know, me and my wife, we were coming up here. I think the first time we came up was like maybe 10 years ago. We have a friend, I have a friend from college who has. He's got like a cabin, like a family cabin on Mountainy Pond, which hmm. is like more inland. Like I think up, I don't even want to say it because I'll sound like an idiot. I don't know where it is. But uh, anyway. That way? <laughs> yeah, it's like more inland, you know. Anyway, and I was like this pond where it's like a massive pond. It's not like a pond. It's like a lake, but it's called a pond, right? Yeah, we get into the technicalities of pond. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I'm not even. Puddle, <laughs> pond, lake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, it was... I don't know. It was awesome in the whatever. It's awesome in the summer, right? Right. And um, have you been here through a winter yet? No, yeah. but I have no. I have no fear. I, I have no. New York fear. City isn't that different yeah, than here. I have no fear, and I, like people, everybody, like when I was moving, my parents are like, "Oh, the winter," and everybody's like, "Oh, but the winter," and it's like, "I'll be fine." Like you know, maybe talk to me in the winter, but I'll tell you, I'll be fine. You know, so we can, if you live within five ish miles of the ocean, mm-hmm. like one day it will, you know, the wind will be from the Northwest and it'll be 15 degrees. And the next day, if the wind turns South, it'll be upper thirties, low forties, like Great. that, you know? So as long as there's a South wind, you're pretty warm. And, yeah. you know, and living on the coastal area of Maine is vastly different than 10 miles inland. Mm, it, mm. it is, it truly is. Well, so. we're currently renting, uh, cause I got here like six weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And we're renting a spot in Cape Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. And I know that's like the shishi area. Like whenever I tell anyone I'm in Cape Elizabeth. If you want to pay really, really high rent, go to Cape Elizabeth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) But I guess coming from New York, it's like not that bad. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Like I'm paying a little less than what I was paying in New York, but I have a house here. You know what I mean? And um, there I had like a two room apartment. You know right. what I'm saying? So it's how nice. much would you pay for a studio like this in where you were at in New York? In New York? Oh man, like um how many square feet is this roughly? Ten, you know? Twenty and like the six hundred? This is about uh I think this is close to twenty four, twenty five feet six wide now. and probably four thirty five feet long. Man, I think you would pay for something like this, you would definitely pay like I think you could be paying like 4K. Wow. Yeah. You have sure. to make so much money to be able to. Yeah, it sucks. It sucks. You have to make so much money. It sucks. Jeez. It's uh, whatever. It's, it's just like the, 
I wouldn't have, New York's awesome because I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now if mm -hmm. I hadn't been in New York. Yep. Because I wouldn't have been able to like make a living off of it if I hadn't been in New York. But how do you know that? Because. Because there's furniture makers here in Maine that started in Maine and are making it. Sure, sure. Uh, and power to them. But I think what, it's kind of like what I do, I'm not special, but like what I do is like, it's more like, it's weirder. It's, it's unique. Like, it's I, like I looked at your work. It's unique. Stuff, yeah. Kind of. It's and so it's kind of philosophical to a degree. Some of your work, <laughs> it, which is interesting. Are you? Are you is that because I said that or are you? Do you no, I oh, okay. I mean, I looked at your website. <laughs> oh, it's okay. like some of this sums are not functional, but oh, it's pretty cool. cool. Oh, cool. you know, okay. like no, no, because I think of it that way and I thought you were having a go because it's no, kind of fun. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I looked at it and it was like, I haven't seen stuff like this. And someone's someone's intentionally making this thing in some way that's not necessarily the most utilitarian sure. thing to do. Sure, sure, yeah, you exactly. Know? So it's, um, I guess what I'm saying is, yeah, there's obviously uh, many fantastic furniture makers and furniture companies here um, who are successful, but I think the, the market for what I do, and actually to some degree the direction in what I went was dictated by where I lived. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I started um, my the way the way I came to what I do now in general was that I finished uh, college and I moved to New York because like I wanted to make art mm -hmm. like everybody like there was there was no question. It's like go to New York, yep, make art. Um, when I was in school, I um, I went to school in Ohio. Oh, where at in Ohio? Oberlin. Oberlin. Where's that? Uh, it's outside of Akron, like okay. 30 yeah. minutes outside of Cleveland. Um, I grew up in Mount Vernon, if you know where that is, for I've a little while. I've heard of it, yeah. Never been there. No need. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and um, so that's how I know winters. Like, yeah. I was there all winter. Yeah, you know? yeah like, that's pretty bleak. not too dissimilar to Michigan. The problem with where I was at was where we were in lake effect mm. clouds. So like Chicago would get these clear, bright days, but we'd always still have that that jet stream flow of clouds being created by the lake that made the gray sheet that made you try and kill yourself constantly. It was okay. bad. Yeah. Ooh, ooh. I mean, it was, it was, yeah, I don't, yeah. It was, it was bleak out there in the winter. Yeah. It's like really flat, right? Where a I was of, at, yeah. A lot of snow. Yeah. Um, very tons, gray. Tons of snow. Very gray. Gives you a lot of time to realize what you actually want out of life. <laughs> yeah. And like you end up obviously doing a lot of silly things because there's nothing to do. So that's, you know, forces you to be creative. In a certain oh, way. yeah. You remember soap shoes? Soap shoes? All? No. Okay. You're well, how old are you? I'm 37. Hey, you're pretty old. So, <laughs> so soap shoes were these shoes that would have like right here, there'd be like a hard plastic thing and you could jump up on a railing and go down the railing. Oh man. And so we came up with this idea because I had these pair of Nike kind of cross training tennis shoes that had this big cutout right here for the viewers at home uh, that we found this icy log. I'm talking about snowy gray winters, right? It was this narrow, it was an icy log that was about that big, but it had ice on top. And we were trying to slide it like you were, you know, maybe on a pair of roller blades sliding something mm -hmm. like a handrail. But I could do it really well because I had this groove in my shoes. And we started like buying shoes, cutting them out and baking on plastic onto the bottom as a means of creating this kind of thing that would be a alternative sport, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah, whatever. And my friend Caleb and a couple other friends decided to turn it into like, let's potentially make this into a business. And they started shopping it. And I was like, eh, I don't think it's going to go anywhere, but have fun. And so they got to the point of having, having a meeting actually with, I think Adidas. And they're like, what's the difference between you guys and this show, soap shoe company? And they're, you know, they're like soap shoes and soap shoes were like, you know, I don't know, a year ahead of them. And it was a big thing for, you know, maybe like a year and a half. It was kind of, kind of like, you remember Heelys or Wheelies? Whatever yeah, yeah, those, those, sc those scooter things, or right. the, the wheel. Yes, yeah, like yeah. go kill yourself yeah, by yeah, putting yeah, a yeah, yeah, wheel yeah. in the heel yeah, of your yeah, shoes. Yeah, yeah, It was essentially a thing like that. That was a very, very passing fad that beat us by like, you know, a year of them, so. Wow. 
Yeah, so gray winters that make yeah, you yeah, yeah. do weird we, things. We, uh, well, I never did it, but uh, cow tipping was a thing. I've never done that either, but it actually works, huh? I've never done it, but uh, I'm sensing a lie. But no, okay. no, I've never done it, but um, <laughs> that was a thing. But um, anyway, so yeah, when I was in school, I um, kind of like developed this. I, I'd always been into like making art, right? Because it was something. Do you know Gabe Sutton? He's from the Akron area, and he's a really talented furniture maker around here. Too. No, dude, but my neighbor, Derek. Derek Preble? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, okay. I'm like right there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he cool. told me, he's like, a couple people, Danielle mentioned, everybody's mentioned Gabe. Yeah. They're like, do you know Gabe? Great guy. He's a great it's guy. Everybody from says, Akron. Everybody like says, says great guy. Great for, yeah, everybody says that. So I got to meet him. Because he is. Yeah, yeah. I got to yeah. meet him. Um, like but, he'll, he'll not stop talking about the qualities of wood and every, like he's, it's he's all good. about it. Yeah. Next <laughs> it's, level. It's next pretty level. cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, I got to meet him. Um, but in, so in school, like I, well, anyway, I was always like making art drawing, you know, everybody draws, but I think I responded to it cause like teachers were always like keeping your, my work and like showing it to the next class, you know, as examples. Yeah, it makes you feel like, makes oh, you feel good. Makes you feel good. I'm right? onto something. Yeah. Man. It makes you feel good. So I think I like got more in the direction just because like people were telling, you know, you know, respond to positive reinforcement right, or whatever. Right. <laughs> and um, so in school, I got into like film photography. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really awesome because it was, I really loved being in the dark room, printing, developing the film. I, I, I love the process. Um, and then I got into like silk screening. And again, I love the process. So I started realizing that like process is very important. Craft, mm. tools, all these artistic forms had these tools, right? They right. had these like process and like the paper, the chemicals and, you know. Right. Um, and then while I was doing film photography, um, you know, I was into staging things. So I was into like the lights and everything. I was never very good at it, but like I got away with it. Right. But like I was into the thing, you know, like staging it and then like creating a scene. Um, because I was into this whole like postmodern idea of like, um, you know, like what's real, right? It's mm. like if you create it. It's We're getting happen. into good places here. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so because, you know, I was saying art history class, you know, all, it was the first time I'd ever been exposed to like what art could be, you know, and then I started learning about performance art, like from the, you know, 60s and right. 70s. And so that in conjunction with the photo, I started staging scenes, right? Because I was like, if it's a documentation of the thing, it actually happened, you know, so it's like, did it happen? Because there's a document, you know, there's a relic of the action, and then it all did all tied in together. Mm. And um, so I started staging these scenes and I realized that while the photo was very important, the aesthetic image, it was very important. I had to look, you know, I, I was into like the clean white back, you know, like what it sounds. I love me some queen, clean white. Yeah, background. it sounds cliche, <laughs> but like, you know, like Abaddon or something, you know, and then like I was really so I realized that it was actually kind of a performance that was being documented because mm -hmm. getting all the people together or doing it or putting on the makeup or creating the action, it was actually a performance. And so I was very into like, you know, Abramovich, Chris Burden, Chris Burden was, I don't know if you know, he was like my favorite guy. He's the guy who got shot. He had a friend shoot him with a 22. Uh, he was a, a California artist, but his, his Did most he famous intentionally have a work of art where he got shot. Yeah. Yeah. His, his piece was, he had a friend stand like 20 feet away from him with the 22 rifle. He stood in the gallery and he was like, shoot me. And he shot him in the arm. And there's just like a photo. Did the guy get to choose where he shot him. Yeah. I think he said like, <laughs> he said, shoot me. I forget like in the leg or something is his friend, like his friend was pretty good. He was like, he like was only a, like a foot off or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. But, um, when you're talking shoulder and a oh, foot for off. Sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> but, um, so when I started learning about stuff like that, I was like, really like, like, whoa, like it redefined what art could be, yeah. you know? And then let's mm -hmm. talk about what, what you think art is like what, art is anything. That's like what's so great about art. Art is anything and everything. So 
what that made me realize was that so it's nothing yeah art can be nothing or can be everything like i mean this is a piece of art you and me talking is art like i can say that i'm going to the grocery store and taking things off of and putting them in my cart and i can say that's my art right. i mean like that's what the whole movement was right like um hmm. i feel like uh ono did a piece called like follow piece where she would like follow people around the city for a day and that was like her art you know yeah. it's like what is that i don't know there is no art's like the greatest game in town right because it's everything and it's nothing I can tell you, oh, sorry, can I? Yeah, that's yeah. fine. I can tell you that this is a work of art, and you can't tell me it isn't. You can say it's a bad piece of art, Yeah. but you really can't say it's not art. There's I mean, no you saw the thing recently where the, the Italian sculptor sold a sculpture of nothing for 18000 I didn't, but I've, I've heard, like, you know, like, I loved, yeah. uh, I think, Piero Manzoni. He was, again, in the 60s. He would, uh, artist air, blow up a balloon sell it artist shit he would just take a shit and can it and sell it you know it's just yeah. like that those ideas were so i mean they were done way back in the day but yeah it was just yeah. like so mine i was like whoa it was just, yeah, there it was, was so some guy who would just sign something yeah and that was the art there sure. it was yeah and at it, it, that it's so interesting to me that as like this you know top of the food chain species we have this thing that we do that we call art and leave it fairly undefined in my introspection in here philosophy whatever it seems to me like my my best definition of art is is working at clarifying what is true and and if that art does not in some way do service towards further truth and truth in its most elemental of nature truth like in some way by following something all day long there's some probably agitation that comes out of that that tells you something more deeply about human experience or something if, if it doesn't touch at some deeper truth in an indirect way in something then to me it it has less value mm -hmm art having more value or less value to me, art that has a high degree of value, we pretty commonly agree on either by associating a number to it or you know, protecting it in the walls of a very expensive building and everything else. Mm -hmm. Like art that is of value to everyone will have a, 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 a large sense of commonality to all of our experiences, mm -hmm. I think but it can have a huge amount of value just to the person doing that art. And it doesn't have to have that other value either, right? Mm -hmm. Because it might be a really cathartic thing for that artist mm -hmm. to do their art and it does something solely for them and that's the reason they're doing it. Yeah. And maybe in the depth of that experience, other people see that and really value it for that and then it does translate into that. Yeah, I think I'll fixate on that point because I think art is like the most selfish act I think, mm. I think, um, I mean, my wife can maybe say otherwise, but <laughs> I, I don't know if she would. But is um, she an artist as well? By no, she's trade, not. My, my wife is. Uh, she's an accountant. <laughs> no, she's she's creative in her own ways, but yeah. she is. We are. I'd say we're more opposite than alike. Yeah, I I have a similar situation. <laughs> yeah. with my um, wife. I think that's that's uh, good meaning. I've been with other people who are too alike and mm. it's like too, it just didn't jive. Anyway. It didn't go any, it didn't go anywhere in a constructive manner. As yeah. Much, it's like too like, you know, like anyway, but, um, no, art is selfish. That's an interesting thing to talk about, but yeah. yeah. But, uh, art I think is a very selfish act. Um, now why so? Because, um, latching onto what you said, I think, um, I mean, I do it for myself. Like, but it's it's a value. Sure, but I'm doing it for myself. Like I, I. Who else would you do it for? And would it be art if you did it in that way? I mean, okay, at a basic at a, at the at, at its at its primal level, it's for me because um, it makes me feel good. It's like I'm very what I do today is based on 
it it helps me feel it like helps me sure. feel good like now why does it help you feel good do you think um because it helps me get out of my mind like it helps me like i'm very i'm like overly rational i'm like overly like uh neurotic and like very like meticulous because it's kind of like this weird thing because i'm like a furniture maker mm -hmm. so i'm super detail oriented like yeah. the reveals have to be eighth of an inch like the material there's can't be i mean a, a furniture maker the underside is finished like everything because like this the the countersink is flush with the material you don't want it too deep because like you know i'm always telling the people where it's like because the furniture maker it's like that's what you pride yourself on like most people will never notice that they never will see it the mm -hmm. client will never see it but you're i mean i guess you're just doing it for yourself it's an attention to detail it's like a and like i'll see people's work and like i'll be like oh that guy you know he didn't he doesn't he doesn't care you know right. it's like and it's i'm but, the only one probably who ever saw that on his piece you know no matter but it's like anyway so there's this like attention to detail that i obviously thrive off of and i do well with um it's very rigorous and oftentimes it's a waste of time because you're spending extra time which is costing you money and the client will never know but you're doing it for yourself so that's what i'm saying it's a personal right. thing um tell tell me more about why why producing this art uh feels or it, it seems like it, you're expressing that it's a, a cathartic process for you getting out of your own head. Yeah. So and it's almost as if you're communicating with you're able to interact with your emotional side yeah. by executing this in a very uh, um, exact manner, like well, the analytical and objective part of you yeah. is, is interacting with the subjective feeling part of you and creating something. Is that I'm 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 loving this. This is very good. But um Me too. Yeah, yeah. But uh I think of it, I mean, we jump I have I have like I can narrate to you like a clear trajectory for how I am the I way I always have good conversations with furniture makers. Why is that? I don't know. Well keep going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like wait, can I jump back like jump a little bit? Because like it'll want. take us to where we are. Yeah. I have yeah. like this okay, so I real so back to like the whole performance thing, right? Because this ties into like how I think of what I'm doing today. Okay, I was talking about how like whatever art can be whatever because I learned that. So like you know this guy Burden who shot himself, he he lay down in the middle of the L.A. freeway covered in a black tarp. You know, you know All what right. I mean? Like crazy, crazy things yeah. that risked his personal safety, but it was for the art. And yep. that notion was just like so insane. It was like so hardcore. Like he went, he was doing some art festival, I think the Kunsthalle in Germany. And his piece was he got kicked down four flights of stairs. So it's like some masochistic shit. It's like weird. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I got it back then. Like, you know, when you're young, you're hardcore. Yeah. And so you get idealistic. Exactly. And that's such a beautiful time because you're like, you know, and so it's so great because like I saw that inspired by it. And so then I started like my work, I started uh, pushing my my body like to to limits inspired by that you know like I spent like a couple hours in the trunk of a car you know had limited locking in the trunk of a car like weird a couple hours in a fridge you know like putting yourself I hope you cut a hole in the side of that you can die doing yeah that. exactly but there's that element you know and it's like why are you doing this because it's like you're testing your endurance there's no reason to do it I that's love what that makes you're it. saying things right now in honesty that people are going to be like this guy's a fucking moron yeah 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 I but know. you were going there because you were inspired and you've it, probably found something about it's yourself pu it's pure because you see it's pure because there's no reason to do it like pretty much everything else we do we do oh, for, a, fi point. for a financial gain yeah. any form of art but like the whole thing is like there was no reason to do that and therefore <laughs> it becomes like the purest act in itself because you're sure obviously you're always gaining something like i don't know i could say that i did it and i overcame that i was over it's self overcoming kind of right. things i don't know anyway i was into it and um then i'm you know so it was like that kind of element like i made this like for my i had like a show and i was into i was into this feeling of um 
I, I studied abroad in France for like half a year in this art program in Aix-en-Provence. And like, I remember I, I climbed the mountain that uh, Cezanne painted. And I remember being at the top of the mountain and you have this feel, I always have this feeling, and I know a lot of people have it, that when you're at a high place, you kind of have this weird- You want to jump. Exactly. I wanted to throw my $10,000 camera off of a high place sure. this last weekend in DC. It was the same, yeah. like something of high value I wanted to see destroyed for some reason. Like, yeah. What is that? Exactly. What is that? And so I was so like it for some reason I was like, oh, I have this feeling. I was like, what is that? And so I started like focusing on like recreating that feeling hmm. because to me, it's the feeling of complete abandon. Like when you jump, theoretically, that's complete abandon. You're just like complete liberation. Right. The end result that's it, right? You don't want that. So like, maybe you do, but I don't know. I think you don't. I think you might think you do, but then in retrospect, you probably don't. Well, it, it's that age old struggle, struggle of freedom versus the consequences. Exactly. And you know, the moderation that has to exist in there. You cannot be, freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Exactly. You know, thanks Janice or no wait, Kenny, who, who wrote that for Janice? Uh, Something she bobby lose. mcgee yeah but someone wrote it for her well, that I was, was famous I, I was i've been listening to a lot of waylon so i've waylon was waylon sings a version of that but waylon didn't write a lot of someone it. wrote it for her as a gift i think and then yeah. she's saying it you know but yeah it that idea of like i want that but getting that actually come because because we are trapped in this reality you, you don't get to have complete freedom you have to and the, the funny thing is the people that have complete freedom, as in they have enough money to do whatever they want and not be constrained by this world, mm -hmm. become r really weird people. <laughs> and, and we don't value them as much unless they've processed that and turned into my, my complete goal is giving to others. Like when you see that, it's a different thing than the Trustafarian who lives off of you know, a huge trust fund and gets to do whatever they want all the time. Mm -hmm. We naturally kind of hold this animosity towards that. It, it's kind of like someone winning the lottery. Mm -hmm. It never turns out well. It, it, it's always like a, it's a train wreck, you know? And there, there's something in a similarity there between that desire for complete freedom, but the actual uh, uh, accomplishment of it, getting that complete freedom, mm -hmm comes at a huge cost like death or you know uselessness mm -hmm. in a way you know if you're if you're not of some stress you know if you don't have some responsibility you're not really useful and yeah. and and if you want to completely detach and have complete freedom from this society you know uh, that's fine but what are you doing you know exactly yeah it's yeah, it's just but it's tension. That, There's this constant that tension, tension, yeah. tension, tension. I'll come to tension later, but tension is also very important. Tension. Yeah. But um so just to wrap it up. So yeah, that feeling, right? Oh, don't wrap it up. So like um the first piece I created was like I had this big two by or it was like a four by four, maybe a six by six or something. I don't know. But it was it would be hanging like on the ceiling. And you would stand here and there would be like a demarcated line and you would hold this rope and you would let the rope go. And this thing would go and it would stop right in front of you because I would have calculated with there, there would be a, a chain on the back that would right. stop it from hitting you. Right. So it was this awesome. I think that's like one of the most successful things I've ever done in my life. Create this thing. Seriously, because you would stand there, you know, and you're it's the release. Yeah. It's coming at you oh, and it stops yeah. short right in front of your it's face. It's like it's. It's a performance art where the, it's the viewer is part of yeah, the performance. Yeah, so it's an interactive. Yeah. I looked at it as an interactive performance. Like I did it, but then anyone could do it. And so I did it, I think, in two spaces and like people could do it. And it was just like, yeah, it was awesome because it's like the release. It's swinging towards you, but it's not yeah. the, the smash at the ground. Right. I mean, you could step forward and not hit your face, but you know what I'm saying? Right. So I was really interested in that idea. And then I did this like other performance that no one else did, but. I would like suspend all these knives from the ceiling with fishing line. And so like, it was a two part piece. So you would walk in a room and you wouldn't know what's up and you look up and there's all these floating knives above you, you know? Tension. 
And then they were all, they all would come to the, 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 all the line would, the way I rigged it would come to the center room. And so then I would come into the center of the room and I'd stand there and I would cut it. And like I had measured it out so that if I went like this, like all the knives like went around me oh, geez, and they didn't dude. hit me. And so it was like that same thing, right? The release. Oh. Anyway, those, I had to mention those because like, I still think I did that probably like, shit, man, I did that like 18 years ago, maybe. When you start saying things like that, it's unnerving, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It so, was like yesterday. Oh, wait. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. That was 18 years. So I think those are the two of the most successful pieces of art I've ever created. I still think to this day. Anyway, um, so then I, I moved to New York. I was doing just continued uh, working like odd jobs, art handling, and just like being like, all right, like I work and then I make art at night, you know, and that's like what a real artist does. Sure. Um, if you start getting paid too well for it, you lose your, you know, it's like thinking of, uh, you know, rock stars in their 40s that are wealthy yeah they don't have the same voice as someone who's struggling at 18 and 20 to yeah. produce the same music yeah yeah it's just it's n it's not true to the experience of what is behind creating something yeah you need like that pressure yeah you know you yeah. need and uh so and i was doing all sorts of weird stuff and then one day i was like working on a photo shoot and um I met this model there who's also like a woodworker and he called me several months later and he's like, Hey, I need some help with the shop. Completely out of the blue. Never been to a shop before. I walked in there and oh, at the time I, this is just important because I was not working at the time because I had been in a, hit by a car in New York on my bike and I had one of those like crazy accidents where it was like, you would have died if you weren't wearing a helmet. Like I smashed my front teeth. I had concussion, yeah. hospital. Anyway, and I was being paid by the guy who hit me because I couldn't work. And so I got really into like, because um, I went to this neuroscience, a uh, neurologist, and he, because I was getting these migraines, he's like, you should try meditating. And so then I had all this time. So I got into meditating and reading all these Zen koans and shit. So I was like into that world. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I went into the wood shop and he was like, oh, cut this and something. And really fast, I realized, I was like, man, this is combining like all the things that to this point, very physical, all the stuff I was doing, I was like with my body, you know, requires focus, like, you know, like meditating, mm -hmm. like every action is like really thought out. And just like all these things fell into place, you know? And so I'd never been in the wood, the craft the shop, nothing, but really fast, I realized, I think this is like what I should pursue. At the time, mm -hmm. I'd also applied to the Peace Corps and I was like, just gotten accepted because I was like, what am I doing wasting my time making art? Nobody's going to see it. You know, like I should do something that's going to help people. Mm -hmm. And then there was this like pivotal point where it was like, should I pursue this thing I just discovered or should I go to Guyana for two years? And I didn't go to Guyana. I think I made the right decision because then I threw myself fully into it. And I was like, um, I did the traditional like apprentice. He, he, he turned me on to his friend who he learned from, a great furniture maker named Paulo Samco uh, in New York. And um, then I was like coming in, you know, five days a week, not getting paid, living mm. off unemployment. And um, then after eight months, I left because I was like, I just need to go do my own thing. Because I wasn't doing like I was like sanding, shaping, but like not allowed to be on the table saws, not allowed to do the joinery or anything. Right. And so I was like, I got to do it myself. And so I rented a little space and then just started it. And, and then, you know, I think 10, 11, 11 years later, now here I am in Maine. Um, anyway, so that's how I got. So it combines all my, I had to give you the long story, but it, to me, to me, you can look at the work as a performance. Like when you're there and you're on the sliding mm. table saw, like you're moving, you're like, it's like a ballet, you know, you're like sweating, you're like bleeding. You're like all, all this stuff. It's like, it's very, it's very physical um there's a rhythm to it now how much do you consider the the balance between artistic uh artistic quality and imbuing that that vision and that voice that you have the philosophical things that you struggle with that you want to point out that that is art mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. compared to the functionality of a piece that is furniture yeah, like so. Increasingly, the the 
it's like when I started first, I was into like uh, Danish modern, you know, traditional like Sam Maloof, Nakashima stuff, the American craft movement, like mm -hmm. really into those guys. So I was really into like wood and like the discipline of it and the love of like you're talking about your uh, Gabe, right? Like yep. all the, wood, you know, very into that. But as I've progressed, I have grown less interested with wood. In fact, if you look at my pieces now, wood is really on the inside of the work. It's like the inside of the cabinets. Rarely is it on the exterior. Um, maybe sometimes like drawer faces, but wood, you know, it's like, I understand, I, look, I'm not a master by any degree, but I understand wood pretty well. Once I understand something, I tend to lose interest with it. And so I gravitate yeah. towards things I do not understand. So um, the whole reason I work with steel was cause like, um, I had a job for an architect and he was like, make this out of wood. And he's like, do you know anyone who can like weld steel? And I was like, I can weld steel. And so like- While that, knowing full well, I have no idea what- Yeah, yeah. Is. And so that's also, that's like the greatest thing about what I do is that um, every day you're, I'm learning so much, you know? And it's also, I mean, the growth is incredible. Like to that, it's like trial by fire. You have to do it right the first time. There's no, you know, so it's like, that's the best way to learn like fuck school it's just like you're gonna figure it out and learn amen it, you know it's just like that's the way you learn and it's like you know i see plenty of people who come like from furniture schools and design schools and it's like on i mean no disrespect to anyone but like the people who haven't been to school tend to be like more interesting to me and a better to creatively and whatnot yeah. um so steel didn't understand steel and still like i love steel I love simple materials because I don't like things that have uh, an inherent value. Meaning so, I work a lot with concrete, right? I love concrete for many reasons. One of them being that it's one of like the simplest, cheapest materials, right? Yeah. It's like an ancient material. I like taking things that have very little inherent worth and giving them value by what I put into them. So I don't use brass. Brass is expensive, you know? I like steel. It's cheap. It's a building block, right? But what I do to it gives it value. So I'm applying all these crazy patinas to it, finishes, putting fire on it to bring out the colors, all this stuff. So these are processes. Again, going back to what I like, like the process. And then um, the value is dictated by the, the labor or the performance that has right. been done to it, you know? And... Um, Another thing, steel is just crazy because like it's so reactive to patinas and you can get all these like I, I managed to get like, I mean, that's why like it's cool because like I look at like so right now I'm, I work with a gallery called Todd Merrill uh, Studio and that's really allowed me, Todd's allowed me to like take it to like this next level because he has the clients. Do you know what I mean? Mm hmm. I always tell everyone the hardest thing about what we do is finding the work. You know what I mean? The, mm. the, the, the work is, the work is easy. It'll get done. It's just finding the people who are going to pay you for it. Right. Um, that's always been the challenge and, um, hooking up with this gallery. Todd's like a great established, um, guy for this weird area of work that is like this gray area of like design art. You know what I mean? Um, and that was a really great moment for me because it was kind of like, it was the highest point in my career of validation in the sense that I always do trade shows and stuff, you know, you want to get your work out there, but it was cool because my mom, I think like 10 years ago, bought me this coffee table book of Todd Merrill's that he had put out with like all the artists. Say coffee table book of coffee tables. No, no, like, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that with all the artists that he represented, yeah. And it was like one of the books in the beginning days where I'd like read it and look, you know, there's all these books that I had that it was like my every night I was so into it. I was working and then I was reading about it, you know. And then 10 years later, I got like an email from his gallery and they were like, hey, we'd like to talk to you about this. And to me, that was just like, Whoa. that was the best because it was like a full circle thing. Yeah, it was yeah. like it, it was proof to me that like I, I found something and I'm creating something. Yeah, that, like. I mean, recognize like that's well, that's if he big. thinks he can make money off of me, that's great. And I'm happy because yeah. that's opening the door to this whole other arena where I can get crazier with my work, you know, because right. like I was always getting like a little crazy, but 
it's hard to find those people to, and, and this again, I'm all over the board, but goes back to like the main furniture makers, right? I don't think I could have been here and mm. have been making the type of stuff that I'm doing now and anybody would have been buying it. Like the guy mm. who's working with me, right? He's like, he's like, man, I, I haven't seen this shit in Maine. He's like, nobody's gonna, I was like, yeah, that's why everybody in New York's buying it. You know what I mean? It's right. like, you're not gonna be selling that here. It's like, it's weird shit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's not like it's not like some and no no disrespect but it's not some like moser stuff yeah, you know it's yeah. just like that fits nicely in a certain place right this i don't know where it fits nicely because it doesn't that's the thing it's like it doesn't fit nicely well it stands out kind you're of thing. you're an ex, you're you're extremely artistic and a, and it's it's very interesting to me how interesting this conversation is and how I know there'll be a certain uh, percentage of the population that will feel that this conversation is ridiculous. Yeah. But they'll feel it's ridiculous because understanding something brings them comfort and they want to stay there. Mm. That doesn't bring you comfort. It brings you interest to understand something and then you get bored and you want to move on. Mm -hmm. I'm the same way. Mm -hmm. That's why I've had... I think 19 cars in the 18 years we've been married. <laughs> I just, I like the experience of like, this is a weird thing to drive and it look, mm -hmm. and then I get bored and I kind of feel it out. And, and I, I, you know, and that's a shallow way of interacting with that. But in the same way, I love the challenge of understanding it. Like back when they first had cell phones coming out, I'd love to get, like you get a new phone and it would be a completely different operating system. And I'm kind of, I didn't have interest in the, process of dark room film stuff i've never enjoyed that aspect mm -hmm. i've enjoyed the composing lighting and how things interact within the frame within reality that you then simply capture mm -hmm. like the that's why i never got into photography until digital right but when I, you'd get a new phone the technical part of it as far as like figuring out understanding how all this stuff relates and how you get it to do what you want it to do mm -hmm. was always a bit of a ah. and then when i got to the last bit of understanding i was like oh. you know yeah there's something about that uh that oh i'm in an area where i don't understand this is invigorating i might learn something and you know and to have this kind of conversation about these very is pedantic the right word? Like, yeah. I love concrete. Like, most everyone is going to be like, you pretentious a-hole. Who cares about? Yeah. But you're like, like, concrete is an ancient material that settles underwater and informs. And, and, like, it's incredible, right? Mm -hmm. But it takes someone who's so bored with everything else that can focus on something weird like that and create something out of it that gets to be in the seat of artist. Right? Because if everyone was, you know, that weird, there'd be no artists. And, and that's right. why the people that go outside of that realm of objective knowledge, the people that go out into that chaos are the artists. They're the, the liberally minded in whatever area they're going out into that, that caustic environment of the unknown and really looking into it and bringing it back to that collective town if you will and saying look what i found i really did some deep introspection and i put this all together and made a you know an objective creation out of my subjective experience and i present it to you is it of worth and they all like turn their back on you or tom what's his name calls you and says hey your time out in the chaos is proving to be something that we think is a value to sell back to the people that live inside the walls of objectivity mm-hmm and that validates you and your lack of ability to stay interested in things with you understanding, staying interested in the things that you understand, right? Right. Yeah. That's yeah, what no, we no. do. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. It's just. It's. Uh, I mean, I completely agree, and it's just like this. It's like what's real, you know? It's like. I was talking earlier about like staging the photograph and stuff. And it's like, mm -hmm. I love, like these are, again, this is, oh, this is interesting. But so like what, um, like when I work on these like finishes with the, I'm painting with patina, I'm uh, applying like colored mortar mixes. I, I make these drawings with a grinder in the steel, in the concrete. And like, these are things that I do 
and they I said before they allow me to feel right mm -hmm. and it's because pretty much I guess this is extremely personal but like emotions are complex very and, and, very complex and relationships with people are complex there's so much wisdom in emotion and there's so much um like you're you're highly uh rational and articulate in in how you act and what you do but you do all that from what you're pulling from these very deep very like wisdom is is embodied in emotional experiences and the perception of those things yeah and the translation of that perception and wisdom into what is real is objective yeah it's the creation yeah we're objectifying our subjective experience yeah. that's that process of yeah, yeah yeah that's the process of creation to me is that you take your experience and in in how much of that chaotic experience that you're able to take that's why the artistic personality is typically so tortured because they're far far more sensitive to their emotions and and i became highly highly um rational and unfeeling towards mm -hmm. my late 30s mm -hmm. and it came to a point where i had to i had to turn around and i had to admit what are emotions why have i shut them off mm -hmm. how do i interact with them again and through for me it's been through uh, harsh introspection and i guess you'd call it philosophy uh looking at it and, mm -hmm. and discovering to me emotions are our native tongue mm -hmm. it's the thing we understand from birth mm -hmm. but we cannot articulate and every experience that you use your objective mind and your articulated knowledge to turn those experiences into common sounds that we refer to as words that we use to communicate the value or, or the experience of our experiences to translate it between people, mm -hmm. um, you build upon that endlessly. And you can get to a point where you forget your native tongue and all you're doing is using your second language, this articulated knowledge. Mm -hmm. But the wisdom is not encapsulated in that articulated knowledge. It's, it's in, it, it doesn't come through that articulated knowledge. It's the summary of it. It comes from the feelings and the experiencing and the emotions. That's why childhood is such an amazing, uh, receptive in, 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 uh, just like absolutely like every experience as a child to me seemed to have much more wonder in it. Yeah. And then as you age, you lose that wonder because you've experienced more. So you have a prejudice towards each experience that you think it's going to be this. So you yeah. process it in that way. But if you keep manipulating those experiences a bit, you start to see what you didn't see before that you maybe never saw in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. There's something about that process of creation that's going into the chaos, experiencing it, but then uh, turning it into something objective. Your furniture is an objectification of your experience that you as a creative artist are voicing to the world. And people have said, it's a value. We will pay you money for it. Mm -hmm. And that's that's your validation, which is really really interesting and the the more honest you can be the more people connect to that i think yeah it's interesting i mean to your to your point yeah it's like the zen idea of like child's mind right you want to approach everything with having a child's mind Ooh, i like that I've never like heard even that when you're before. washing dishes like have a child's mind about it and like if you just oh. it can be a completely new experience if you had the mind of a child right it's like and therefore life becomes infinitely richer yeah um and also to what you said previously about being like cold and unfeeling and like having to like you know it's like i think that that's why it's like i have issue human relationships are complex feelings are complex and there's this this area that is like not concrete mm. at the risk you know what i yeah. mean it's yeah. so ambiguous and it's it's i i think i often or in my life i've struggled with that element uh, of emotion you know whether it be my own emotions or my emotions in relationship to other people. And it's, and I, I've, I've kind of, I'm also, I think my wife would say, I'm like pretty like cold and, and I, I feel obviously, but yeah. it's like, I can't deal with it. And it's just like, you yeah, know what I mean? No. And like, I, mean, I deal with it rationally. You're I my don't, doppelganger. I don't, yeah, I don't inform myself. I don't allow the emotions to inform me as much as they should. You know? Let me give you some advice from 45. Okay. Uh, you got to turn around and face those things. Um, 
and I mean that in the most metaphorical way possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, like I came to uh, about two years ago when I had blocked so much emotion that everything was a rational uh, dissection of anything. And it, it, it became very, like I could not feel anymore. Like mm -hmm. I'd gotten to that point. And there's been a huge turn for me in the last two and a half years that's made me um, so much more at peace and understand so much more by, um, so I, I put my emotions away because it was killing my marriage. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was, I was too much only uh, responding to emotions of self-centeredness and, and I could go into a litany of theological and psychological reasons of why that was happening, but the result was that I was specifically being very selfish. Mm -hmm. And I had to simply put those aside and use rationality to right the ship, right? And so I became a better person for, for my wife and kids to be around, mm -hmm. but I was, I was cold, and, and dead inside to myself, right? And it got to one morning where they were leaving to go to church. I don't go to church anymore. And I was sitting next to the front door and they all turned and looked at me and just kind of said like, are you okay? And like, I was just sitting there gonna give them a hug goodbye. Yeah. And, and they could see like just holes in my head where I should have been. I mean, your eyes are are an extension of your nervous system. They're like, part of your brain mm -hmm. like if they pull your brain out the eyes come with it kind of thing unless you break the nerves and, you know they're like truly as close as you can get to physically interacting with someone's mind mm -hmm. right but that moment to me for some reason triggered in me this idea of like yeah i don't feel anymore and that was a really weird thing for me where I have a room full of sticky notes and I wrote it down, what are feelings? And I, I put it on the wall as something to think about. And over time, I just came to this idea that emotions are our native tongue, that they're extremely inarticulate, but they just hold all the depth of wisdom to communicate to you through, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can amass all this knowledge, but it's not gonna be the same thing as wisdom. You know, and for me to make that turn to then use the articulated knowledge that I had accumulated and allow myself to listen to my emotions as volatile and as hard as they are. Like I, I now sit around and uh, just in normal thought by myself can start like crying mm -hmm. Because of the feelings that I'm allowing myself to interact with, mm -hmm. like just for the people in my life or the people that I know are in pain. And it's, it, I allow those to come up, mm -hmm. but I also interact with them with my articulated knowledge. And I think a lot of people think that over life you put childish things behind and they mass emotions into that. Mm -hmm. And they think that that rationality and reason is like a sign of maturity. But if it's not a balance of the emotion and that, yeah. you get this, this um, distillation of a very caustic thing that the, the Egyptians had a, a sentiment that uh, logic and rationality will have a very malevolent side to it if embraced too deeply. And that's exactly what I was experiencing. And that ability to consciously say, there's something to be said to me through my emotions it allowed me to start to look at concepts, thoughts, and realize things about myself that I was not realizing because I wasn't combining that articulated, rational knowledge with a full embrace of my emotional side. And oftentimes, we don't, I don't think we learn to communicate the two very, very well. And I think art, and artists in particular, have, have uh, a, a well a well-versed or well-thought-out artist has a has a really good um, ability and voice to combine those two and, and give it to the world as a means of like epiphany, you know? Yeah, I think, again, to what you're saying, having a daughter, my daughter Wanda, she's like two and four months now. Um, 
that's definitely obviously helpful because it yeah you're you know it's like putting something there that these new experiences um, in, intense emotions and me and relating to her and trying to understand or just be not respond rationally and lot you know what i mean to all that that's a good exercise for me right, right. like to try to break that that down you know try to be more like you know what i mean get into it you know because i have two boys and if i can be present with right. them it's so hard sometimes but when you get into that zone of being present present with children it, it's really it's such a bond and you 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 all of a sudden see them it's uh, that it doesn't do it justice that sentence but you see their soul and you can be present with them it's just beautiful yeah it's uh it's like I'm a new father, but it's hard. It's hard, but it's like I see it's 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 something that the, everything we're talking about. It's helping like it's helping make me better and like whittle away that 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 wall of rationality and logic. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That's like oh, yeah. constantly debilitating. And be before having my daughter, the only thing, and this goes back to the work is like like building all the stuff. Everything has to be precise and everything right. That's it but the the finishes on it right like the last steps like the the painting on the steel using the fire the making the drawings and stuff uh, what i find fascinating about that is that often i'm just like staring at these inanimate objects and because most of my stuff is intuitive so it's like and this comes back to trying to feel i stare at this thing and i'm just like I stare at it, I sit there and I stare at it and then something comes across me and it's whether I go with it or whether I don't. Hmm. And often I'm like, I don't know, that'll mess it up or no, but it's like always like I try to do first thought, best thought. And it's like, don't hesitate, just do it. Like make that mark with your grinder because hmm. that feels, it's cathartic and it's, it's this interesting thing in my brain because my brain is like, it's rational. It's like, no, don't. And it's just like, tension what i said earlier it's like this tension it's like you power through it and that's like before having my daughter that's like the thing that would allow me to feel it's like this weird i know it sounds mm, fucked up no, but no, it's no, like that's... this weird way of like feel dude like don't don't overthink it yeah you know because yeah. everything's overthought and it's like specifically these these i do these drawings they mean nothing they, i don't know they have there's this like weird length there's symbols that they're literally, they mean nothing, but they're, I use certain repetitive symbols because they feel good. And the action is so important because it's like, you can't undo it. When you cut into steel, you can't erase that. And if you slip up, it's there forever, right? And it's just like such this like high stake because you've done everything on the piece and this is the last thing and it could mess it up completely. So it's this like tension, but it's about like letting yourself do it. And it's like, how do I decide what to do? I just feel it. It's the same way I love abstract expression as paintings because mm. like I just stare at them and I feel something. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I have no idea, but I like certain ones like because like like Motherwell's one of my favorite painters and it's just like I don't know, it's mm. like super minimal and simple, but it's just like a distinct action and it's just right. like you just feel. So yeah, feeling, I don't know. Yeah, it, there's a artist that was in Maine for a little while, Heather Chantos, that um, I, I'm not well versed in art or much of anything really. <laughs> and uh, I, I remember her, she did something with Gabe where he made the chair and she uh, did the upholstery mm -hmm. and um, her art is extremely uh, colorful and expressive. And just from interacting with her and seeing what she did how she did it and then seeing it i was like man that is just emotion on canvas is what mm -hmm. that is and i saw her work and and i have two two or three of her pieces and they're not her best pieces because we were like exchanging for work and mm -hmm. her her stuff you know goes for far more money than than i can afford but the pieces i have of hers i really love and it's, it's very interesting for me to have people come over and, and some people look at it and they're like they they feel it yeah and then other people like 
they look at the technicality of it and they feel that they could do the same thing. Mm, yeah. And they just don't understand yeah. that the, this is not a technical thing that yeah. you're observing here. This, this, these are emotions that have come out of the spiritual metaphors into reality in that sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the subjective experience has come into the objective and it's on our wall. And like the only time I ever really get to have any work of art affect me is if I'm in a uh, like a situation where I'm stuck in front of that work of art for some time and I can't go anywhere and I don't have like a phone or something. So anytime I like my wife and I would go to marriage counseling because I was mm -hmm. a selfish asshole and they'd have some art there and you know inevitably it would be some crappy art that was bought at like michael's or something, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. but i'd get lost in it and i'd start to see things in it and i'd start to feel things because of the relation and it wasn't great art by mm -hmm. any stretch but like i'd start to be affected by that thing on the wall and because i'd be in that vulnerable situation of talking about feelings and everything else while not necessarily looking at a person, but looking at the wall and that thing, the colors, the shapes, the, the brush strokes, whatever. It, it just, I started thinking and processing and it was just very interesting to me for to experience that. And I can do that at home now with Heather's work that I actually have on my, on my wall. And that's a really, it's something, you know, and I don't, I don't know how to really verbalize it more than than that, but it's it's very valuable. It's a, it's an introspective thing that they've handed to you to go back into their experience that they found some truth in. You know? Yeah, it's like I think like the best art is like a. I guess this is maybe too aggressive, but it's like a trigger. Oh, you know, triggers can be good and bad. Yeah, you know? I just think of the negative connotations of firearm, but it's sure. like, you know, like uh, it's just yeah, it's like you see it and. There was no the, the maker had no intention really because they were probably doing it to exercise something from themselves but back to your point it's part of the common experience and it sets something off in you mm -hmm. it could be completely different but that i think is like real success and i actually think back to what we started with about art being the most selfish act well i am doing it for myself nothing gives me greater joy than if someone comes up to me and say that they, f they felt something, you know, mm -hmm. I guess that's, that kind of brings it full circle to like the, the most, I guess that's probably what it's all about, you know? Yeah. I, I think somehow pushing people, adults, pushing adults back into their feeling is 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 a difficult thing because life takes it out of you because mm -hmm. every every fact that you can accumulate you can put in a warehouse to use to your s selfish advantage but if you can if you can hand someone you know something that's of an understanding nature something that works universally something like uh, a process of understanding or an emotion that that helps you by one understanding one thing really well you can understand anything that sentiment if you can hand someone that key to open them up a little bit more and a little bit more to what they previously were in that childlike moment of doing dishes like to be in that childhood state of mind that is not simply childlike in that it's foolish but it's childlike in its openness to what else is there to see here that that's just of such incredible value to to progressing this whole thing that we have going on here yeah life uh yeah it'll it'll, it'll beat you down make you cruel bastard you know? yeah That's yeah you need, uh... and, and if you it, it at at this age i'm witnessing people around me choosing to become angry and bitter and i saw too much of that happening in myself and it, it was crushing me and i don't want that and you have to choose to focus on that. Like sometimes you'll interact with people that just seem 
overwhelmingly like they've decided to be positive and it's naive. Yeah. But at some point, there's some that you can tell they've thought about this and, and there's a choice to, to, to focus on that yeah. rather than the negative. And, and you can be extremely deep and introspective and everything else while still choosing to be positive and it in and if you can combine that in a, like genuine generally the people that are deep and introspective are are some real wet blankets like i can be mm -hmm. you know like i'm sure you can probably be mm -hmm. but if you combine that deep introspection with the understanding of like you know this is conflicting because i can see what's going on underneath the surface here and that's disturbing but if I can look at this as like my positive touch point here is truth, if we can bring this up and fix it, that's a positive thing, you know, and to, to learn how to do that without making the common person feel, you know, like you're just being critical. That, yeah. I mean, it's always, there's really no reason not to be positive. Do you know, like, I mean, like, my wife, God bless her. She's, I'm, I'm like the negative guy, you know, yeah. she's positive. She's same. always looking, same. she's always same. looking, she's always positive. And like, on to your, I'm always like, in my mind, I'm like, how, like, that makes no sense. Like what I like, you so, know, and it's like, there's no reason. So you must go through struggling with times of depression and stuff. I'd imagine you yeah, seem I'd, to I'd, be I'd, far too introspective to be positive all the time. And I'm saying this because that's how I experience life. Yeah, I guess I never, I mean. I, I, I never experienced depression yeah. at a point where I can't get out of bed. Yeah, yeah. But there's definitely like, I would be called moody by my wife for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like maybe I'm like walking depressed. I don't know, you know? Like I've never, right. I love like, I love going to the shrink, man. Like I went to a sh shrink for like five years straight. It was you the can best really thing. work some stuff out. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Like I'm all about ther therapy all the time. Loving therapy. I haven't gone into therapy in a year, unfortunately, but I'd. Anyway, but yeah, I'm moody, moody. My wife's so, yeah, I'm moody. That, that's right. definitely how she would, like, I'm always like, she calls me Eeyore. Yeah, yeah. You know, but like. You might be perceptive and worth listening to. And oh, people well, will take it as I'll have that. i like replay this. For if you can, <laughs> if you can stay positive. So it's this huge thing, like um, Tim and I were just having like a big, long conversation about this, that there's this process of, so people who know a lot, we have a word for, and we call them know-it-alls, and we don't like them. But mm -hmm. people who understand a lot, we don't have a pejorative or negative term for them. Because a person that understands a lot will get to a point of knowing very few things because they understand that actually knowing something is almost impossible. Mm. Because like you're saying, what is true in reality, mm -hmm. right? Truth is a horizontal proposition. As soon as you can get to that horizon where you thought the truth was, the horizon has moved beyond you. Mm -hmm. It'll always be that way, and it always it'll is just how it is. But if if you can learn how to interact with people, and I there there's some term that this is, but it's basically um, it ask listen, uh, clarify the person's point, not disagree, not make a statement, but just listen clarify the point that they were making, ask a further question. Never, if you can interact with someone in a way that never makes a declarative statement, all you're doing is working with them to understand. But if you're coming at someone with facts and knowledge, you're just gonna have a fight. It's gonna con. Now, if you pursue this too doggedly, the people who are not used to actually being listened to and being questioned, will get a little frustrated and yell at you to just make a statement after a while. Uh -huh. It's very interesting. I've just in the last like month started to really delve into this kind of interaction. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's fascinating when you actually do it because you start to see that people actually understand so much more than they know. So they, they actually understand it if you keep asking those clarifying questions. They knew it already, but they just hadn't connected that breadcrumb trail or something. It's, it's really, really fascinating. And I've, 
my wife is is of a very very um very she's extremely intelligent she can recall anything she's ever learned or known she has a good memory insane memory. my wife the same that's insane why i always i always memory. lose i always lose you know because oh, yeah. it's like she'll be in it's like so if my <laughs> my wife and i disagree on let's say religion which we do all the time it, she knows every single bit of any arguing point of anything so if we if i'm making a statement that uh contradicts anything that's of an established knowledge she knows it right away and she can also emotionally unseat me. And as soon as I'm emotionally activated, I have no ability to calmly, rationally consider mm -hmm. and engage. I just become like, eh, you yeah. know, and then it doesn't go anywhere good. But by simply listening, clarifying what a person is saying, and then asking a further question to take their statement a little deeper, just a little deeper each time, just each time, just keep asking questions to walk it backwards you get down to a point where neither of you know the answer. And if you've clarified every step there, you're not really in any disagreement if everything they've clarified is of an empirical knowledge base, right? Mm -hmm. But if, if someone starts to say, well, I just feel this way, well, okay, that's an interesting conversation. Let's go into why we feel and, you know. So it's, yeah, turn around and face your feelings as much as you can bear, mm -hmm. <laughs> but if it, if it's a, you know, uh, they can be kind of like fire too. That's a great thing when it's under control, but if it's out of control, it'll burn you alive. So yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm on the same page. It's hard to, uh, it, it always seems to go, go south when, when yeah, the feelings it, pop up like that, you know? Yeah. And it, it's, especially for my wife and I, it's, it's hard because we have two little boys that are highly religious because we both grew up in the same religion. And I'm not of that uh, thought process anymore. I feel closer to God than I've ever felt, but I'm adamantly um, agnostic. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most intellectually, it's the, it's the clearest intellectual position on what caused all of this. Mm -hmm. it, it's like, Tim and I were just saying this again, it's like if you had a really, really blurry picture of whatever the cause of all this is, mm -hmm that would be far more accurate than some photo that was in focus of whatever caused this mm -hmm. because we cannot contain within our own imagination really what would be responsible for everything that is mm -hmm. it's impossible it is it you know it's the analogy of an ant trying to understand humans they can't encapsulate in their little tiny thing what the complexity of what we are and what we create and why we just drive over them. Right. You know? So, yeah, this, this is a, this is a beautiful conversation. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, it was good. It's, it's, uh, it was nice. It's nice to, I'm not much of a, I mean, maybe counter to this. I'm not much of a, you know, I don't, I don't really enjoy talking. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, maybe it's not apparent here, but it's like, you know, cause I, Right, uh, you again, don't most, enjoy you know, most, talking about shallow things. Exactly, because most trite. of the time, most of the yeah, I, 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 I I'm the it's, same it's way. My, it's my, it's, 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 it's my bad attitude. But typically, it's like I'm always just like, what's I bad don't about wanna, your I don't attitude? Wanna, I know because my wife's like, because I'm like, I don't want to talk. She's like, you know, I don't want to go do these s trivial things like talk. To, you know, <laughs> most stuff's banal. You know, <laughs> yeah. like if I want to get, if we were gonna have a good yeah. conversation, I'm all there. But it's yeah. like. It's, it's my like being like, it's a waste of time to do that. There's sure. so much, you know, if it's so, a good conversation, I'm, I'm all there if we talk about like the deeper stuff, but most, you know how it is. Most of the stuff is just yeah, yeah. on the surface because people, so yeah, I don't know. I've seen it, I've seen it go south and I've seen it be the most beautiful thing that I wish I could be a part of but in an, or, or have the same relationship in the same way. I've seen a relationship where one person was very um, far more relational and uh, and extroverted and maybe not as uh, deep and perceptive and everything else where the other was. And they didn't find the beauty in each other. Mm. And to think that only one is beautiful is is wrong. Yeah. And, you know, what you have uh, is is beautiful and is of value. And it's not right or wrong, but it's your part. Mm -hmm. And the other side, this, what to you might seem shallow and 
uh, not of value, but much more expressive and talkative and yeah. If you don't have that thing in your life, you'll blow your head off eventually. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll, I'm the first one to tell you that I'd be a miserable bastard. If yeah, I didn't have and my would wife. you yeah. want to? Like sometimes I think like. <laughs> Holy cow, if I had married some, like you said, if yeah. I had married someone like me who yeah. I felt might be going to those emotional places that I know I go, I would feel so scared. Yeah. Like I couldn't, like, oh, I don't want to be responsible for you going down there. Yeah. And that's why you're with the person that you're with. You know, yeah. you, you intrinsically know that. And in like, the people I saw it work really well with, with my parents, no, no shame to my mom, but she's not a, she's not a deep intellectual like my dad is, but mm -hmm. my dad is able to appreciate the, uh, the ability and beauty of life that my mom brings to the table. Mm -hmm. And she's able to appreciate the introspection and depth and moodiness that my dad brings. And the, and they've recognized the beauty in each other and, and allowed for it and said, yeah, in this situation, why don't you take the reins? Because this is good for us. And in some other situations, you take the reins because this is good for us. And, it, and to see that to people who've realized that and have a strong love and affection for each other, even when things, you know, nothing's ever going to be perfect and other people from the outside can think it's just that or the other. And, but to, to witness that is, is very um, like, it gives you hope. You know, because mm -hmm. I know in, in my relationship, I can always so often just feel like hopeless. Like, how can this ever come to something that's, you know, a, a, a constructive good thing that our children should be around all the time? Like I can get in that, like my wife calls it like a global, like I can be down about something mm -hmm. and I spread it onto everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I always know, like. Four days later, I'm like, what did I think? And that was, yeah, <laughs> I mean, we're so happy. And then like four days later, and, oh, yeah. you know, and, you know, just the experience and that to me, that turning to face your feelings, but also remembering your articulated knowledge of like, yeah, remember a week ago when you thought this was all just going to be horrible? Like, it's not. And so like, make it through those, those dips and everything and. But at the same time, I don't want to do disservice to like I've had a friend who went through a really bad divorce and some nasty stuff. And and he was up here assisting me. And and I was like um, trying to like passively kind of like, yeah, you know, if you just eat right and exercise, you know, and he was of the like he was on some strong medication because he just couldn't get out of bed, yeah. you know, and he's like, yeah, that's all fine and good. But there's some days where it feels like you're getting on the highway, but you're running and everyone else is in a car. Mm -hmm. It's just not going to happen. And I've never experienced like moodiness or depression. I'd call me moody, mm -hmm. but not like that. Yeah. That That is, I don't know how to understand that. And I, But I also know that I've, I've, I've been on the on-ramp on like a... Uh, maybe like a really like on a moped you know <laughs> like, uh, yeah yeah but not trying to make it on foot you know so whatever. yeah it's uh it's a uh, it's a wild ride but um uh, i've got a lot to learn but you know everything i can say is that i'm i'm very thankful and humbled that i'm able to do what i do and like make a uh a living off of it you right. know i i consider myself like one of the the lucky few you know what i mean that i constantly am thinking the same thing but i also realized that i i never would have made it in a normal job of any sort like i would have simply i would have i don't know if i'd be homeless mm. i don't know but i've had normal jobs that I could only last for like a couple months mm -hmm. and I just, I'd hit a wall and I just, I can't do this. I cannot keep coming to this same place that I fully understand. It's uh, it just soul crushing for like whatever individual, you know? Yeah. Yeah. My, my, my wife laughs cause she, she works in the, the business sector corporate. So yep. she's, she always, sometimes she remarks is like, 
it'd just be so funny if you had to do this, you know? Because yeah, like, I gonna... haven't. I think I had one job in my life where I was in an office, and it was a summer job in high school. Yeah. And since then, I've never, I've never worked in front of a computer at a job. Like all the jobs I've had were just like, like assisting photographers or building galleries out, lab labor stuff like stuff. Right. So. I think, I think I'd I'm probably be a, I'd probably be framing or something because at least it's, you're never doing the same thing twice, really. And you see, and you see another thing that I'm so lucky is like, I, I'm, I often say I'm like a caveman. I'm primitive because like I, I'm lucky. Like I see things grow in front of my eyes. I literally right. see the labor invested. I see it happen. Right. Whereas she's working on abstract things, documents, tangible things that exist in the ether, you know, right. and you don't see your work like and what I do is I see it. It happens. And well, so that's like, interesting. She's pulling from data. Yeah. You're pulling from emotion. I'm pulling from. But the art, material, the art part of it. Material. Is, I'm putting from tangible material. Right. She's using a computer. You're using tangible material. She's using data yeah. and creating something. You're using emotion, uh -huh. but then translating it through material. Sure. That That's that's an interesting thought. Yeah. I can't, I can't, like my wife is very creative writing. Like if she writes a story, I can't speak in story. Like mm -hmm. I don't, I don't understand how to create story. Like, set the stage, build the conflict. Like, I'd have to really, really be consciously thinking about that to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't. It's not natural to me. She thinks in story. Like analogy, metaphor in that way for her is full creative. Mm -hmm. But in all other aspects of life, seemingly to me, no creativity. <laughs> Interesting. But, yeah. Well, no, relationally, she she can operate re relationally creative creatively, where if I'm going into a relationship, um, forgetting if I go into a situation where I'm trying to get someone to build something for me, I rely highly on a objectified contract. X, Y, Z, mm -hmm, sign, mm -hmm. sign, accomplish money. Yeah. yeah done. Yeah. yeah. She, we built our entire house and barn, uh, basically no contracts, just relationships between her and people doing the work. Wow. Creatively. She's confident and knows and cre can create in that environment. And that, that is a creative thing. I think, I do think that everyone is creative. It's just, we kind of categorize creatives as actually making some objectification that's that's physical as a painting or yeah. a performance art or a piece of furniture or a sculpture whatever you know yeah so i'll bet you if you if you keep watching your wife you'll see the creative like oh my goodness there it is <laughs> yeah yeah no I, I see it all the time and i like latch onto it because she's like she's like i don't think i'm creative i'm like no this is you there's so yeah. many ways where it's like yeah everybody's got their different ways it's just like i'm in a unique job where it's like that's how i make my money right you know it's it's quantified and right there's a dollar amount affixed to it so it, it's a it's a the same thing i feel the same thing so constantly that it's just such a nice thing to be able to be uh making a living uh through your own it's kind of like your own struggle with reality like you you've monetized your struggle with reality in some way that, yeah, that, you're that, getting paid for life. Yeah, yeah, and like your your manifestation of your struggle with life comes out in your art, and people value that enough. It's it's a very it's a very deep calling uh, that is 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 hard. I mean, you have to say things as silly as "I'm deeply fascinated with concrete," you know. And I mean, if you're not willing to go there, yeah. you're not, you know. Yeah. And I mean, anyone who would hear that statement and say, "What a pedantic." pedantic a-hole or whatever yeah they're not going to be able to make a living off of doing something like that i just read a fantastic article in the atlantic about a wall builder you yeah. know a guy who builds like dry stone walls oh there there's one over in new hampshire that leaves the ground turns and goes back to the ground and someone with dry stone i think i haven't gone and taken it apart and seen wow. if there's anything inside stone wall leaves goes up 
you can it like goes over a stream or something it goes up and turns like that it's square it goes up and turns and comes back down i the, i i next time i drive by it i gotta photograph it again it's so amazing yeah I mean, that's the thing like wall building like that like i want to build like when i get a piece of land i like want to lay the, like a stone like i've stone walls yeah they're very fascinating all the me. stones on my land are round mm. and so i just pile them <laughs> yeah you know well i pile them in a wall but it's a very not or like not not a stable wall it's not a craftsman's wall mm. by any stretch yeah. I, I have my areas where i yeah and all my all my creative energy is reserved right now for either photography or philosophy focusing on theology mm. and the the cool intersection is is this podcast mm. that that i get to talk to people like yourself who've really uh oddly thought about these things mm. like very in a very unique way it's like comedians that really look at situations and find how they can kind of like kick them in the nuts and see what happens <laughs> it, it's it's interesting you know yeah. so yeah. no this has been uh this has been great it's been uh i you know i enjoy talking about <laughs> it As i think it's evident i could go could go on yes yes well i had i don't know what time it is but oh yeah i have a, another one coming in 30 minutes or no it's a, a zoom thing with some guy out of la that does sustainable homes in the desert that are minimalist so cool should be interesting i think so yeah, yeah. thanks for coming down now do you have a, a studio or a mill do you work in the mill here like yeah my my studio is in uh building 15 suite 104 right, it's right so next, next to derek, to derek yeah. like literally next to derek he's my neighbor Tell Derek I said hi. Uh, you should listen to the podcast I did with Derek here. I've been friends with Derek since I moved here. He's he's a really good guy. Yeah, yeah. Love Derek. Yeah, we seem to get uh, along. Yeah, yeah. He's <laughs> he's a great guy. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm sure I'll be seeing you around. Yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, it's funny. I've seen a lot of people move here from Brooklyn for some reason. Yeah, it's terrible. I would art. Are there like other terrible. places in the world where everyone's running to from Brooklyn or is it just Maine? It's just like, I'm not like a, I would never go to the West Coast. Yeah. And so like, I would never go south. Why is that? Because I'm just like, my my sister-in-law lives on the West Coast. And like, I've been there a couple of times. The, the, the geography, the, the landscape is Incredible. great. Incredible. Great. You know, it's just something about the vibe of the people. Not like my sister-in-law, but it's just like, it's not. yeah, it's just like, you know, it's just like, I don't know, you know, there's people make fun of it. They make fun of here. They make fun of there. There's a certain vibe, a certain like, it's just something. Know. It's not my. I want to be I'm not, able to articulate it. Yeah. And I I'm feel not, the it's same not like, way. I'm, it's not like I'm a New Englander, but like if I had to go like where in the country, it's like, I feel like I just, this is, I don't know. The vibe is more, it's just something about the vibe. Yeah. You can't, it's too ambitious. It's like. It's That's an emotion. My... You you subjectively feel yeah, that it's... thing, and you can't necessarily articulate the mathematics around why that is not where you want to be. But it's yeah, like, yeah. You know, like if it'd be great if like the West Coast, you know, they've got great things over there. Yeah, you know, you can get everything within like great waves, two hours. You know, good weather. Yeah, but but mm. the like something about just the the I don't know something cultural or. I don't know. No, I'm I'm on board. We vacation out there. We spend a good amount of the winter out there because the surf is so good. Yeah. And it's warm for the time that it's extremely cold here. But I love being here up till like January and you experience all the harsh and everything else. And then if you can get out till like March ish, it's it's just like the the for me, it's the perfect balance. Like, all right, I'm going to go just be self absorbed in my comfort and just spend time with the family and surf it's it's really nice but there is something like i'd never want to live out there with that vibe of what it is it, and i that's yeah yeah mm, interesting well thanks for coming over and uh taking the time to do this it, yeah, it's no been problem. a really interesting conversation uh had no idea what to expect but why did why did that comment hit you so weird uh with um saying that your your work seems philosophic oh because like last night because like danielle was supposed to send me like questions mm -hmm. 
she was like supposed to send me prep questions for this or something which is never useful because i never stay on topic. yeah and <laughs> well i was like to her because we talked a week before and i was like are you gonna like i was like i want to be prepared like i was like i don't know that's the saying. worst thing you could do yeah and so uh and like last night i wrote her like late i was like did i miss the email like are we gonna get prep questions? and then she wrote me back like at like 11 30 or something yeah or she, earlier in the week, she wrote me like, she's like, is there anything you want to talk about? And I was like, I can easily talk about like materials, inspiration, philosophy. And so that's why I thought you were touching yeah, on like what she said about that. Because huh. like I'm saying, as you saw through the discussion, it's easy for me to talk about like what I mean by philosophy is like the ideas behind it. Well, that's the interesting part yeah. to me. And that's what like I'm, I can I'm always trying to get at. I can wax like, you know, eloquent about those like things I can like, you know, all these highfalutin things that like uh my wife would probably be like oh <laughs> you know he's at it again <laughs> you know here he goes yeah here he goes again <laughs> about this you know so um but no this is cool i love talking about this shit like i could talk about it you know these are the conversations that uh when i have to go somewhere to do some trivial shit i wish that they would be happening you know but it's so <laughs> people don't like I guess that's why, why this is essentially my marketing because I can't do like mixers or like like main home design like five years ago, ten years ago, whatever was was owned by a group that did a lot of like events and mixers. And I'd try and go to them and I would just feel so weird because all you can do is like I don't drink. So I'm that's, standing yeah, that's there exactly like, oh, too. my word, I'm trapped in reality where I'm extremely uncomfortable experiencing large amounts of anxiety of like trying to think of stuff I don't care about to yeah. talk about to find commonality with people. So we can then talk about deep stuff. I fight that now by just going right to the deep stuff and making people uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the terrible thing about those things. Cause they just lead you to drink. Oh, well, there we go. Yeah. Maybe that's why I never got on board. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, cause it's like, what am I going to do? You know, it's like, yeah, I guess yeah. I'll drink more. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. This is becoming really fun. Yeah. And then you're under tables, licking people's feet after yeah. a while and biting their ankles. And yeah, everyone's yeah. like, what's wrong with this guy? Yeah, oh, yeah. he's an introvert and he's artistic. So <laughs> yeah, it's okay. yeah. 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 Exactly. Right. Huh. All right. Well, that was awesome. Let's do it again next year. Okay. <laughs>